Good morning. Got a, uh, uh, I got a very, we have a very interesting uh, symposium uh, for you today. It sort of uh, represents uh, many years of work uh, generating these guidelines. I've, we've got four excellent speakers. Um, Cindy and I um, spent a fair amount of time trying to uh, find the uh, appropriate speaker, so I think, uh, I think you'll enjoy what they have to, to, to tell you guys. Uh, just as a reminder, if there's questions, uh, please use the app. I'll be, uh, Cindy and I will be monitoring it uh, during each session. The way we've decided to do this uh, session is after each speaker, we'll have about five minutes for questions and answers. Um, that way, everything will be fresh in your mind uh, as opposed to wait, waiting till, till the end. Um, so uh, with that uh, sort of out of the way, I'm going to introduce my co-moderator, uh, Cindy Brady, uh, and she's going to sort of talk to you about um, guidelines and, uh, and the, how they're developed and uh, how they should be used. So Cindy, please. Thanks, Manu. We have no relationships to disclose, <clears throat> excuse me, relevant to this presentation. So I have one quick announcement um, before we get started. Um, the LEAP program, or Leadership and Education for Advanced Practice Providers, meaning nurse practitioners and physician assistants, has been renewed and there will be an RFA in September or an RFA for a new cohort beginning September 2023. Uh, we are more than halfway through our pilot with 13 fellows beginning in June of 2021, <clears throat> excuse me, and concluding in May 2023. We are, I am co-chairing along with Jordan Dunnitz and Cindy George at the CF Foundation. It's going really well, it's exciting, so spread the word. Um, you can contact us. Uh, the emails are below the, this slide, or I'll be available afterwards if you want to talk directly to me. So I'm going to get started and just do a review of clinical practice guidelines. Um, and I want to start out by thanking Sarah Hempstead and calling her out for the amazing work she does at the CF Foundation to really guide the guidelines. There's so much behind the scenes work and we are very grateful for Sarah's expertise and dedication to these guideline documents. So what is a clinical practice guideline? Well, the IOM or Institute of Medicine definition is that clinical practice guidelines are statements that include recommendations intended to optimize patient care. They're informed by a systematic review of the evidence and assessment of the benefits and harms of alternative care options. I also want to talk for a second about what they are not. Well, guidelines are not laws. They are not strictly enforced and contrary to popular opinion, there really is no guideline jail. <laughs> They're really meant to provide guidance. You know, there's one constant on Lake Superior, and that's rapidly changing conditions. This week, we commemorate the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. That was an iron ore ship with 29 crew members that was lost in Lake Superior in the gales of November 1975. It's been memorialized in the Gordon Lightfoot song. It was a ship doomed due to a change in the wind and lack of guidance. Everyone here in this room is very much acutely aware that CF is changing rapidly. But not so long ago, it was stormy for all persons with CF. Over the past decades, thanks to research, an innovative care model by the CF Foundation, and broad, uniform application of clinical care guidelines, all persons with CF had improved survival, clinical outcomes, and quality of life. Now, because of highly effective modulators, most, but not all, persons with CF are leading even longer, healthier lives. But we are not done. 
Today's CF is not only a rare condition, but very diverse, with many variants and manifestations. People with CF have a variety of needs. Research and study design that inform guidelines are changing too. Guideline methodology is changing. And evidence-based practice guidelines take a long time to produce. Well, how long? Two years. That's because the methodology follows a certain sequence. Most of the guideline documents that are published by the CF Foundation fall into two categories on this busy chart, the top two, clinical practice evidence-based guidelines and consensus guidelines or statements. They follow a typical path by convening a panel of experts, a multidisciplinary team, developing PICO questions and systematic literature re review, recommendations, statements, achieving 80% consensus, then they're put out for public comment, revised, submitted to a peer review journal, reviewed, revised, and then published. The difference between a clinical practice evidence-based guideline and a consensus statement is the grading of the evidence. You will see other documents more and more coming along that can sort of bridge the gap between the time it takes for an evidence-based guideline. You know, guidelines by nature are going to lag behind the evidence and even clinical practice changes. So other documents that are called position papers, state of the art, clinical considerations are coming along and they have some of the same methodology but maybe have a smaller panel of experts, a more focused lit review, do not have formal grading of the evidence or recommendation statements may or may not go out for public comment, or maybe an in-house document, such as clinical considerations. So how is the evidence graded? Well, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force has a method. It's A, B, C, or D. Pretty intuitive. A and B are good grades, okay? They're fine, a B is fine, okay? <laughs> I know you guys. Um, <laughs> But that means there's high certainty that there's moderate substantial to substantial benefit that the service should be offered to those it's recommended. C, uh, pretty good grade. You know, there's moderate certainty that at least there's small benefit. And a C grade opens the door for really considering individual patient situations. You need to have a conversation between the clinician and the patient to determine whether this service should be offered to that particular patient. D, don't do it, okay? There actually is pretty good certainty that this is not helpful and may be harmful. So for example, Pulmozyme got an A and a B, good grade for Pulmozyme. But you might be surprised to find out that albuterol got an I for patients with CF who do not have asthma. So this is where the, the grades are nice to look at when you see an evidence-based document and look at the, the grades those statements get. That can be helpful in determining whether something is useful for your patient or not. Well, there's an evidence pyramid. Different types of evidence were weighed differently. This is evolving. The pyramid in the upper left corner is the traditional evidence pyramid. At the base, it begins with a case report or case series, an idea, and moves up to what is considered less biased and more truth. Observational studies, cohort studies, finally getting to randomized control trials and systematic review of the evidence. Well, there's a move to sort of redesign this pyramid and perhaps chop up those systematic reviews or meta-analysis and use that as a lens to look at all types of evidence. As we heard yesterday, the way we need to obtain evidence in CF is changing and these, what we come to know may not be only provided through randomized control trials. Think about it, observational studies have a lot of value. 
We figured out that smoking causes lung cancer that way. We didn't do a randomized control trial. We didn't give a whole cohort of people candy cigarettes and the other ones two packs a day for 40 years and then follow them up, you know. That was neither feasible or ethical by any means. So systematic reviews are very helpful. They're strength in numbers. And things can be missed if we don't look at many studies together. And RCTs have a lot of value, especially for medications and getting something approved. But we're finding out there's bias in RCTs too. Those who participate are often different in important ways from the general population they're taken to represent. And we heard about this yesterday. So here's a great example of a evidence-based CF clinical practice guideline. It had graded recommendations, the Pseudomonas paper from 2014. Um, there were three statements. One had an A, one had a B, and one had a D. The upcoming CRMS guidelines that'll be out in the next year or so will be graded. So that leaves, not leaves, but allows for more art in consensus guidelines. Consensus documents provide guidance when the evidence is insufficient to grade due to quantity, quality, conflicting conclusions, or uncertainty about the balance of benefit and harm. They use pretty much the same method, but there's no formal grading of the evidence. And a committee votes on the statements and must achieve 80% consensus, which means general agreement. Every paper today, we will discuss our consensus statements. So, the traditional model of CF care was one size fits all, you might say. It brought great benefit to many persons with CF. Care guidelines targeted the downstream effects of CR dysfunction. They were broadly applied to every person with CF. And for, for those still waiting for new therapies, the traditional model may be the right fit. But an evolving CF care model means finding the right fit. And how do we do that? Well, with COVID and highly effective modulators, over the last few years, care teams have become very nimble. You've taken the time to reassess our model and prioritizing the needs of individuals. We're having better conversations, offering more flexibility, developing trust, open dialogue, goal setting, and partnering for shared decision making. So the emerging model of CF care brings art and science together to, to guide care. You'll find guidance in the future in a number of ways based on new ways to obtain evidence. You may see more position papers or state of the art from programs such as Envision, Digest, and clinical consideration papers from CFF. Oops. And I just took myself out of there. <laughs> just click back in. I don't know, yeah, I don't know. I can open it again. It, so anyway, um, be open. And I'm just gonna go to the end and wrap up and introduce Adam. Sorry about that. What I wanted to end with, and I think our patients and caregivers are going to lead the way in these efforts. Thank you, and I would like to introduce our first guideline expert speaker, Adam Kimple. Adam, Dr. Kimple, is an assistant professor in the Department of Otolaryngology at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. His primary clinical interests are centered around individuals with genetic defects and mucociliary clearance, i.e. CF, and primary ciliary dyskinesia. He co-led the development of the CFF ENT consensus guidelines. So welcome, Adam.
Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk on the uh, otolaryngology or ENT consensus uh, recommendations. So uh, I'm going to briefly go over a little bit of the background. So chronic rhinosinusitis, or CRS, is universal in individuals with cystic fibrosis. And so if you do CT scans or nasal endoscopy, everybody will have inflammation historically uh, pre-highly effective modulator therapy. We know that in CF, as well as outside of CF sinusitis, management of this condition improves quality of life. And that generally is our largest metric for success in chronic rhinosinusitis. We live at the base of the pyramid as a surgical subspecialty, uh, so, so we are primarily observational cohorts, case series, institutional studies, and so there's really limited evidence to base our treatments on. And we know that management varies widely across the country, and one example of that is shown here, where rhinologists or otolaryngologists were asked how you would treat an individual with cystic fibrosis and recalcitrant disease of various ages. And so this first patient here, there, there was fairly strong consensus, about 60%, that an adenoidectomy and functional endoscopic sinus surgery would benefit this patient. But when you change the demographics of the patient and put a four-year-old, all of a sudden, nothing reaches much above 20% consensus on what should be done for this individual. Some patients say an adenoid, or some physicians, and, and these were all ear, nose, and throat doctors, about 180 of them, would recommend just an adenoidectomy alone. That's a pr pretty simple outpatient surgery in somebody with uh, reasonable lung function. Adenoidectomy and maxillary antroscopies, which is kind of a very limited form of sinus surgery where the cheek sinuses are open. And then 20% of the uh, participants uh, recommended an adenoidectomy and a full endoscopic sinus surgery, which is probably a three to four hour type of surgery in this individual. And then uh, uh, probably one or two people recommended an extended functional endoscopic sinus surgery or medial maxillectomies, which is a, a, a much more aggressive surgery in this four-year-old. And so you can see kind of the variability of, of what we should do is really not understood by the, by the glo overall medical field, but as well as the otolaryngologists who are responding to the survey. To talk a little bit about hearing, first a disclaimer, I'm a, a, a little ENT doctor, and so uh, hear, hearing is not my passion. But to kind of explain this side over here, we hear from the very low frequencies to the really, really high frequencies. And in general, language takes us to about 5,000 hertz. <clears throat> the human cochlea, or the snail-looking thing over here, has the technical ability to hear up to 20,000 hertz. And one of the reasons why we'll be talking about hearing screening later is, is because a lot of ototoxic medications actually preferentially remove the high-frequency hearing loss. And so if you lose this part of the cochlea, you lose this part of the hearing spectrum, which actually isn't necessarily important for understanding speech. And so the whole premise of ototoxic hearing screening is if you can detect problems that are occurring here, before they start occurring here, you generally don't have significant compromise of, of your speech and language understanding. Ototoxic medications are all around us, and I think in cystic fibrosis in particular, aminoglycosides are the main culprit. Uh, tobramycin specifically. And in an ENT clinic, we'll actually infuse gentamicin in individuals' ears to completely remove their hearing and vestibular function. And so that's how kind of toxic these medications can be uh, to the vestibular cochlear system. Uh, glycopeptides like vancomycin specifically uh, ha have, have reported ototoxic effects as well, although it's less kind of clearly understood how that works compared to the aminoglycosides. And there's likely some synergy between aminoglycosides and, and vancomycin specifically in kind of exacerbating the ototoxic effects of these medicines. Macrolides are another common class of medications that lots of our cystic fibrosis patients are on. Lots of my non-CF sinus patients are on these, azithromycin for months long as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, and again, this is a little less well understood, but definitely has documented ototoxic effects. Uh, macrolides typically tend to be reversible, and so it's not quite as concerning as the aminoglycosides. Uh, but, but still some concern, especially when you start thinking of the things that we're putting our patients on. Toby nebs, tobramycin infusions for exacerbations, and then they're kind of uh, three times a week azithromycin in addition to that. You can kind of see the compound effect that we're just beginning to understand uh, as far as ototoxicity is concerned. And so if you look at uh, individuals, this is a, a study out of Europe, if you look at individuals who report normal hearing, this is in an adult population, and, and you, these are patients with no documented hearing loss, and you actually screen them for uh, hearing loss, 
you can see that we're getting up to kind of almost 30% of patients here have a hearing loss at 1200 hertz. And so the interesting thing about that is that's well outside of the speech range. And so these people aren't going to notice that they have that deficit at this point. And so if you can change your management kind of early on when you're detecting patients above that 8,000 or 10,000 hertz, whatever your cutoff is, you could potentially work with the pharmacists and kind of change some of the aminoglycosides to other medications to kind of reduce hearing loss in the future. So kind of given the, the sinus contributions as well as the ear contributions, the, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation assembled a committee. Uh, and, and I was one of the leaders on that with uh, Brent Sr., uh, another rhinologist. And, and so I think it was probably a unique committee in that it was two non-pulmonologists. Uh, and, and we were definitely herded by our shepherd, Sarah, throughout this whole process. And, and we sincerely, sincerely could not have done this without her help. And so our process involved an in-person meeting uh, in June of 2019, well before COVID. Uh, we determined clinically relevant questions. We performed a systematic review with the uh, expertise uh, of, of Lane Resnick. Uh, and then we voted on questions on virtual visits. And I think the, uh, the systematic review highlighted what we, we were well aware of. And we live at the base of the pyramid. There aren't randomized control trials for, for most of the things that we do as a surgical subspecialty. And so there's not a ton of kind of grade one, grade two evidence uh, in this realm. And so doing the consensus format, which it sounds like all of us uh, here, here today are going to be describing, uh, we voted on our recommendations. And I'm going to highlight kind of the ones that I think are more pertinent to this field. I don't see a lot of surgeons in the audience, and so I won't go too in detail to, in, into that. I think I had dinner with most of them yesterday. Uh, but uh, the, the first one, I think, is, is kind of really straightforward for, for you all, and that's that CF individuals in clinics should be treated kind of uh, with, with contact precautions. And that really just shocks the ENT world, where we had never heard of this before. Uh, even MRSA-positive patients in clinic, truthfully, often kind of get through with, with no precautions at all in our outpatient clinics. And so I think from an ENT standpoint, I mean, that has changed my practice and my partner's practice. And I, I think that's, that's helpful. And it's actually uh, the, the patients like it and feel like they're getting taken better getting taken care of better with, with those contact precautions, trying to get them roomed right away. And so in, in my ENT clinic, we kind of flag the people with CF. My nurse does at the beginning of the day, so we try to get them out of the waiting room uh, into a room, uh, and they're roomed uh, with a gown nursing assistant, and then I see them using contact precautions as well. Uh, the other kind of universal recommendation here is that individuals with symptoms uh, should see an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and that reached 100% consensus. And I think the, the symptom component of, of that is really the tricky part. And because when you're taking care of individuals with cystic fibrosis, they've had symptoms or they've lived like this their whole life, and so often they underreport the symptoms they have. Uh, not having a sense of smell is normal. Having kind of a mild dyscusia or a, a taste disturbance is normal because of the nasal drainage and the lack of olfaction when they're eating. Uh, having thick purulent drainage from their nose is relatively normal. And so teasing out these symptoms does take a little bit of extra work. I think the two options that are acknowledged here and, and options in, in this document uh, are basically things that in some situations make sense. Not necessarily for everybody, but in, in the right scenario, these make sense. And one of them that uh, the, the ENTs actually really liked is trying to meet these patients before they have lots of symptoms. Uh, and so that's definitely a burden to the patient to have a referral to an ear, nose, and throat doctor without symptoms. Uh, but I see a lot of patients with individuals with cystic fibrosis who they don't complain about symptoms to the pulmonologist, but when I see them, they have polyps halfway hanging out their nose and, and kind of pseudomonas crust throughout, at least historically pre-trichafta. And, and so I think there is probably a role for the asymptomatic referral if you're working with an ENT that you kind of trust uh, to, to kind of coordinate care uh, as well as not be overly aggressive uh, with, with surgery. Uh, regarding the sinal nasal recommendations, uh, for, for kind of the, the mainly non-surgeon CF caregiver here, I kind of wanted to highlight two things. The, the first was a recommendation to use a, a, a sinal nasal quality of life tool in adults or children to try to identify people with symptoms. There's been one study uh, utilizing the SNOT-22, which is a, a very clever name for a sinal nasal outcome test. It has 22 questions. And in patients who scored higher than 11, when they were referred to the otolaryngologist, there was a high prevalence of kind of uh, nasal polyps and sinonasal disease. 
And so even though patients often under-report when kind of asked specific questions on, on these types of surveys, it actually seems to be able to kind of uh, identify patients with sinonasal disease. And, and the other uh, consideration, or the other recommendation that I think <clears throat> a lot of our pulmonologists start is kind of a one-month trial of isotonic saline rinse. And so uh, in the pulmonology world, I think hy hypertonic is often prepared for ne or pre preferred for nebulizer treatment. In the nasal world, though, I think the isotonic is easily, more easily tolerated and much more gentle on the nose. And the reason for that is really the surface area that your drug is getting to. When you're doing a, a hypertonic saline neb, it's making it down to the airways, which have a massive surface area, whereas the irrigation in the nose kind of, it's being directly delivered and not distributed in, in the mucus too significantly. And so the, the hypertonic definitely causes more irritation, a little more epistaxis, and so the recommendation for is isotonic. Uh, we, we don't endorse the Neomed product, but uh, it's, it's the simplest one that can be gotten at Walmart, Target, CVS. There's similar ones. Generally, the squeeze bottles are easier for adult patients at least to do because uh, you don't have to kind of do head yoga, as I tell my older patients, with the, with the neti pot. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other thing some of your patients might have mentioned is the Navage, which looks like a genie bottle in front of your face. And the only patients I recommend who spend extra money on the Navage are patients who have kind of ear pain when they do the rinse. And so if you squeeze that bottle in your ear and your eustachian tube is kind of perfectly positioned, it can actually blast the water into the ear. And so that'll be perceived as pain and then sometimes popping afterwards. And, and the Navage is a unique device. It costs about $90. And it actually sucks the water from one nostril and just lets gravity push it in the other one. And so uh, I haven't had any patients who complain about kind of that ear pain from the Navage relative to the squeeze bottles. Uh, the, the daily price is higher, though, and so I generally recommend the, the saline standard squeeze bottle unless there's a reason to go uh, more in-depth with the Navage. Uh, so the, those are kind of the two main recommendations I wanted to highlight for this audience here. The other sinonasal recommendations uh, were to use intranasal cortical steroids, but only in individuals with allergies. <clears throat> and that kind of opens up a, a whole new Pandora's box of how do we diagnose allergic rhinitis in an individual with cystic fibrosis who has kind of chronic rhinitis or chronic nasal inflammation all the time. Uh, and I think further studies are need to better understand are there certain questions we can ask individuals. If, if they have an exposure that results in worse nasal symptoms, I think that's kind of uh, help, helps identify them. But a lot of patients just, w when I look in their nose, it's like kind of blue and boggy as opposed to kind of just inflamed like CF. And so uh, identifying individuals with allergies is tricky. But intranasal steroids, in the opinion of the committee, their biggest role should really be in the allergic patient, not all patients with CF. Overall, uh, when I prioritize kind of what I'd, kind of regimen I'd like patients to do, I think the saline irrigation is good for nearly everyone, and uh, nasal steroids are best reserved for people that you think they have allergies or, or do have documented allergies. Uh, the other uh, recommendation here is sinus surgery who have symptomatic CRS uh, after appropriate medical therapy, and that's generally antibiotics, irrigations, maybe even topical antibiotics, and if they're still having symptoms, uh, surgery is reasonable, and there, there's decent kind of case series that demonstrate an improvement up to several years out of surgery. Uh, and then the other recommendation, kind of probably not surprising to you, is uh, to, to continue perioperative airway clearance. We generally tell patients not to cough, not to strain, not to sneeze with their, uh, not, not to sneeze after surgery. And so I think th those types of things need to be taken off the table for individuals with cystic fibrosis because we need to keep kind of the airway clearance optimal. The options, which are the kind of the, the lesser degree of recommendations, and so in some patients, th these are reasonable options regarding sinuses, uh, is uh, using intranasal corticosteroids for all patients. So as I said previously, I think irrigations for everyone, intranasal corticosteroids for patients with allergies, and that's kind of mimicked here. Uh, the other options here, this is kind of a very surgeon-specific thing, doing more aggressive gravity-dependent surgery for individuals with cystic fibrosis. Uh, perioperative antibiotics, uh, I think that all, all, kind of, all of us should work together as a team. I always talk with the pulmonologists about what the antibiotic plan is, preoperative admission, postoperative admission, outpatient surgery, because they manage their stuff better than, than we do sometimes in, in the hospital. Uh, and so I think that's kind of just highlighting that, that multidisciplinary coordination uh, around surgery for individuals with cystic fibrosis. 
Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I was listening to kind of complex cases this morning, and they talked about topical sinal nasal antibiotics. And so I think the thing to highlight here is that it's, uh, it's really helpful in individuals who've had endoscopic sinus surgery. But if you have somebody who's never had sinus surgery, those antibiotics don't necessarily get everywhere we want to. Uh, and so the sinus ostia or the little doors to the sinuses are about one to two millimeters uh, in a patient. And so when you do that Neomed sinus rinse bottle or the Navage, <clears throat> you're really only clearing out the nose. Uh, and, and as I tell my patients, the nose is basically the main hallway in your house and the sinuses are all the little rooms and, and the doors are closed enough that those rinses really don't get into the sinuses themselves without previous surgery. Uh, once we've done surgery, and, and, and the way I talk to most of my patients about surgery is like, my surgery isn't going to cure you. It doesn't change your CFTR. It doesn't change your allergic rhinitis. But what it allows is more accessibility for these rinses. Uh, and so in patients without rinses, I think there's kind of limited evidence that kind of topical antibiotics, topical treatments work. It can sometimes be worth a try if it's, cost, uh, if it's not cost prohibitive for individuals. Uh, but a lot of these things that ENTs like to do, uh, topical steroids and rinses, topical antibiotics and rinses end up being covered out of pocket uh, depending on kind of coverage of, of the state or insurance plan. The, uh, the otologic recommendations uh, as a, a self-proclaimed little e, ENT uh, were, were rather surprising to me and these were really patient driven uh, at, at our first meeting. Uh, and, and so th these are kind of the big surprise to me from our consensus guidelines was kind of the importance of hearing screening uh, for individuals with cystic fibrosis. And so the recommendation is for a baseline hearing screen, and, and we don't give a, a time range, but I think uh, we, we'd say kind of the various stages of life. Hearing screening is probably dr dramatically more important in, in young children uh, who are developing speech uh, and can't necessarily communicate it. Uh, the, the other recommendation is for ototoxic monitoring annually, and so that would be for individuals who are kind of on tobermycin a couple times a year to, to get the screening annually so we can hopefully identify those high-frequency changes uh, before they come into the speech range. And then the third recommendation in that category is that if you've identified somebody who has hearing loss, it's deemed necessary to be on another ototoxic medication i.e. tobramycin uh, in infusions, that you should really closely follow those individuals after you, you know they have hearing loss because if you don't want to contribute more to bringing that high frequency hearing loss into the speech threshold range of the kind of uh, 1,000 to 5,000 or 8,000 hertz range. <clears throat> And I think uh, th this is likely a, a burden uh, for the CF care team. Uh, you don't necessarily have an audiologist integrated into your team. You don't necessarily have those contacts. I think this is one of the reasons why having kind of uh, visits with an ENT is, is good, even for the asymptomatic person, because they can kind of arrange that in their clinical visits. Uh, and, and so I think those relationships will definitely need to be formed. Uh, UNC is uh, starting off a, a, a new study looking at a tablet-based screening in the CF clinic in the pediatric side. Uh, hi historically, the problem with tablet-based screening is it would screen up to like 5,000 or 8,000 hertz, and so you're really catching things too late. And, and so uh, th this proposal that the CFF funded is going to be using a higher frequency tablet-based uh, hearing screening tool uh, to look at whether we can identify patients uh, to make to change interventions on in the future. And hopefully we'll have those results in a, in a couple of years. <clears throat> and then uh, recommendations against, uh, <clears throat> didn't necessarily want to highlight any of these specifically, but we recommend against uh, corticosteroids, uh, routine use of corticosteroids through nebulizers. The, uh, the, the bioavailability of nebulized steroids in the nose is drastically higher than it is when it's irrigation. Uh, probably because you get more lung involvement even when you're kind of inhaling it through your nose. Uh, we recommend it against uh, sinus surgery for the indication of declining lung function, which in my world of, of nose surgeons is, is something that's commonly stated. Well, why do you do the surgery? Well, their lungs were getting worse, and so we operated on their nose. Uh, and there, and there's, there's not great evidence for that. Uh, and then there was a recommendation against routine balloon surgery. Uh, and in one of the complex cases this morning, they were kind of mentioning that balloon surgery has some advantages, and it does, because it can sometimes be done in the clinic, 
Uh, but I think that the problem in cystic fibrosis frequently is that uh, if you have nasal polyps, it doesn't remove the polyps. Uh, if you have kind of th this thick mucus, you probably can't even get it out after balloon surgery, and so there's probably a limited role except to kind of revise like a frontal sinus. Uh, and, and so I think the last uh, 20 seconds of my talk, I just want to mention that I said we started this in 2019. Tricafida was approved in uh, October of 2019. And so the whole world has changed since this process started. And, and so uh, this is a, a nasal endoscopy of a classic cystic fibrosis nose, green, crust, all that. And post trichafida everything looks beautiful and, and healthy in these two individuals. Uh, I was kind of skeptical that uh, trichafida would have improvement or uh, triple therapy would have improvement on nasal polyps, but here you can see polyps at the top, polyps kind of throughout this osteomedial complex between the septum and the nose. And after uh, triple therapy for six to nine months, basically the, even the polyps disappeared. And so uh, I think that everything we talked about is true in a subset of patients uh, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this pans out over the next couple of years uh, as to whether ENTs need to be as involved anymore because uh, even though that was the nose I, I would assume that the the tobramycin and the aminoglycosides is hopefully decreasing dramatically as well and so these guidelines may be very pertinent to a, a subset of patients who are either not modulator candidates uh, or, or are on modulators with persistent disease, uh, which we are starting to see. So thank you very much for your time, or my time. <clears throat> we have a time for a, a couple of questions. Um, one question that was uh, asked is, um, was there any consideration of the vestibular toxicity of some of these drugs in development of your guidelines? Yes. Uh, so. Ototoxicity, by definition, consists of cochlea, which is the hearing, and the vestibular system, which is the balance system. And so uh, we use the term oto to kind of do all screening, but it's kind of all encompassing of both of those. Okay. Another question, actually, two, two people asked about dupixent in CF. Yes. Uh, I think uh, du dupixent is almost as miraculous in trikafta in some patients. And so uh, the interesting thing about CFCRS is that it tends to be a neutrophil-mediated inflammation. And dupixent works really, really good in Th2 immune phenotypes, eosinophil polyp disease. And so is there overlap? Yes, there's absolutely overlap. Do, uh, would I start kind of a routine individual on CF who couldn't do trichafida on dupixent? Probably not, unless I knew that they had this kind of mixed phenotype and it was kind of a TH2-dominated disease, not kind of this neutrophil disease you see uh, more, more prevalent in cystic fibrosis. Um, uh, would you uh, consider or recommend nasal steroids for polyp management if a patient does not have a right, uh, an allergic component to their rhinitis? Uh, so, so that's uh, a hotly debated topic among rhinologists who like cystic fibrosis. I personally do not. Uh, Dave Gudis is an outspoken proponent of it. And, uh, I think that it's worth a try, but I wouldn't encourage it if you don't get any benefit. And, and that's the same thing I tell my I, individuals with cystic fibrosis that I see clinically. It's like, I want you to try the rinses, but if you can tell me it's not helping you, I'm not going to harp on you to do it. Like, my goal is to improve quality of life. If the pulmonologist tells me that their nose is contributing to their lung infections, I, I mean, I'm interested in that as well, but it's really improving quality of life. And so if, if you do two months of mometasone rinses in your nose and you don't notice any difference, I think you should stop. Uh, I think it's a, a reasonable thing to try. It's easier than surgery. It's cheaper than Dupixent. But I think the, uh, the efficacy uh, is unknown, and I'm skeptical because of the neutrophil-dominated disease seen in, in cystic fibrosis. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Next, I'm going to introduce Joanne Cullina. Joanne is Master's in Nursing, Advanced Practice Registered Nurse at the Northwestern Chicago Cystic Fibrosis Center. She's Program Coordinator. And Joanne has been around CF and a nursing leader in this community for many years. So I'm grateful to have Joanne here to discuss the colorectal screening guidelines. Okay. 
thank you, Cindy and Manu, for having me here today uh, to talk about a topic that sounds a little strange to say, but is near and dear to my heart. Um, but we've now we've we started at the top, and now we're going to the bottom. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, so as we all know, um, as CF is, is progressing and moving forward with some amazing changes, and um, back in 2015 when the foundation reached out about colorectal cancer screening, approximately 50% of the population was over the age of 18. Yay for our adults. Um, so these therapeutic advances are length, continue to lengthen the lifespan. Uh, according to data we received here at conference, we're now up to the median survival of 53 years of age. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So now that they're hanging around longer, they become at risk for other issues, other diseases, and in particular, gastrointestinal cancer. So we do know that individuals with CF are at a five, not transplant or anything, just the general CF population is five to 10 times greater than the general population. So now let's give them a transplant. They become 25 to 30 times greater than the general population. So what do we do? What, how can we meet this risk and start preventative measures? That led to the colorectal cancer guidelines. So we're getting ready for that colonoscopy there. So the task force was um, brought forth in 2015, again with the help of Sarah Hampstead. She's, she's everywhere. Um, and we, we looked at the increased risk of CF, uh, colorectal cancer and CF. And um, a lot of it has to do because of the impact of um, the fact that we have a disease, a disease that impacts not only just the lungs, but the gastrointestinal system. So we had a pulmonologist, gastroenterologist, social worker, a nurse coordinator, myself, a surgeon, an epidemiologist, a statistician, and most importantly in this group was an adult with CF and the parent of a child with CF. Cannot forget them as we begin to look at these things. And they were particularly the adult with CF who had already had a few colonoscopies, um, was very advantageous because she let us know a few things uh, when it comes to cleanouts. Um, so we were broken down into three work groups. What is the cancer risk, those who have had transplant, and procedure and preparation. I got put in, I was in the transplant group. So what did we do at that first meeting? We developed our PICO questions and selected relevant search terms. And then our wonderful guideline specialist from the foundation conducted an evidence synthesis based on the PubMed literature searches, found 12, roughly 1,200 articles. They were all divided appropriately to our three groups. We all screened them. No, we did not read completely all 1,200 articles. Um, but from that, we narrowed down to 198 articles. Those we all read. We analyzed 123 for the development of our guidelines, and then we had 50 articles that were actually used in the final manuscript. So there was also some modeling going on, and I had never heard of modeling prior to this uh, committee, um, where they looked at some independent decision analysis on the benefits of screening relative to the harms and the resources. They used the University of Medical Center in Rotterdam, Netherlands. And the modeling then, they looked at a benefit and cost saving for screening, um, giving that life, different, that life expectancy difference from the general population. They used the registry data from 2010 to 2014. And so then they looked at both um, 
non-transplant and transplant. And based on the data that was examined, it was determined that individuals with CF should start screening at the age of 40 and be screened every five years unless the results tell them it needs to be done sooner from the age of 40 to 75. Why stop at 75? Because we don't have a lot of experience with individuals beyond the age of 75. Hopefully, we'll be able to get that data soon. And then, so transplant recommendation is that there should be um, colonoscopy pre-transplant, provided the uh, urgency of the transplant allows those people that walk through the door and all of a sudden um, looks like they need to go to transplant. We're not going to say, stop, wait, you got to get a colonoscopy. Um, but they need to be looked at every three years. And that happens because of the immunosuppressants that they are on throughout their lifetime. They go from 30 to 55 years. Again, why stop at 55 years? Because we don't have a large population to make an assumption of individuals post-transplant at the age of 50, at 55. So again, that's something we'll, as we continue to go further, we'll learn a little bit more. So we came up with recommendations stating that basically they need to be a shared decision need to look about comorbidities and safety and quality of life for individuals. Screening should be done by the CF care professionals and an endoscopist. So hopefully you have a good relationship with an endoscopist. Colonoscopy is the recommended screening exam for colorectal cancer in CF. And you know, I know I've already had the questions from patients about all these other options out there, you know, like why can't I just mail my my stool in, you know, all these other fun things. Um, that has not been tested in CF, so we can't guarantee that it's going to be um, recommended. And then uh, colorect in general, colorectal cancer screening begins at age 40 with rescreening every five years. The literature review that was done identified multiple anecdotal published reports, either a single case or a case series of patients with colon or colorectal cancers. And unfortunately, some of them were diagnosed even before the age of 40 and it was more symptomatically. So we want to catch it before it becomes symptomatic because the earlier we can catch anything, the better. Nearly all colorectal cancer develop in developed in persons less than 50 years of age. Current recommendation for the non-CF population, at the, the time I started writing this was 50, but now it's down to 45 years of age, is not appropriate for CF because we did see so much colorectal cancer before the age of 50. Individuals with CF who have had a colonoscopy that had, um, excuse me, I screw this up every time, Adenomatomous polyps have surveillance colonoscopy every three years or as needed, because that's an indication that we need to watch for the possibility of further development. Individuals 30 years of age and older who have had a post-transplant should begin tra transplant within two years of transplant. And when we, we talked about this, we wanted to make sure there was stability, obviously, um, with the individual. So you, you don't necessarily want to take someone who's not in the best of shape and take them to colonoscopy, you just might toss them over the edge there um, by telling them just what the prep is. Continued colorectal uh, rescreening should be done every five years in the general population. And for those who are tr three years, for those who are um, post-transplant. So they need to have intensive bowel preps for optimal e examination. I've learned a lot about some of this just working with our own gastroenter gastroenterologist. Um, three to four wa washes minimum of a liter with each wash. And the last wash needs to be four to six hours prior to exam. So as you can see, it tells you what's good, what's not. You know, patients are always like, well, yeah, it, it was liquid. I'm like, yeah, but what color was it? You know, they're like, what do you mean? It was brown, why wouldn't it be? I'm like, well, that means that's telling me you've got more stuff in there and the, the, you know, 
that's why the, the GI doc is telling you that we have to repeat your colonoscopy. So trying to, and this is something actually that um, our GI docs have started putting in charts when someone's inpatient um, in getting a colonoscopy. So even the staff can say, what's good? Are we there at the right point yet? So, no poops, just, just Skittles. So implementation, key piece, and can't say it enough, education, education, education. We've got to remember this is a population of individuals who at one point in their lives were told that they probably wouldn't be making it to this age in adulthood that now we're talking about colonoscopies. So we need to educate them. We need to obviously, before we even get to the patients, we need to educate the team, make sure they're familiar with what the guidelines are and what the recommendations are and then what the procedures are. Start early and often, you know, in Chicago we say vote early and often. Well, we're going to start early and often with the education here. <laughs> Share statistics. People have been amazed when I tell them what, how different their risk is from the general population. And it's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll do it now. You know, because you know, they're always like, well, I thought it wasn't in each 50. Um, and I'm like, and I explain it to them, and it's like, okay, there I go. Couple of tools are this YouTube video, which I'll show you in a second, from the foundation. And then also there is a handout, um, Be Prepared for a Successful Colonoscopy, that's also from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out on such short notice. Lungs and colon are on their way. You all know the plan, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, we gotta convince colon to get a colonoscopy. I don't think he understands how important it really is, especially with our cystic fibrosis. Pancreas, I am a bundle of nerves. Don't overthink it, brain. Keep cool. <laughs> Shh, they're here. Hi. Yo, hey, colon. How, how is it going? Fine. What are you guys all doing here? We, um... Need to talk. What's going on? For starters, we all love you and we're worried about you. Mm-hmm. Really worried. With our cystic fibrosis... We need to... Take care of ourselves. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You're putting yourself at risk. And us, too. Yeah, did you know that colorectal cancer is the third leading cause of cancer death? And that because of our CF, you have five to ten times greater risk of getting it? Oh, uh -huh. wow, no. And I've heard that if you have a CF-related transplant, the risk is 20 times greater. It breaks me to think about it. Have you... Been screened yet? I, I haven't had the time. I've been dealing with a lot of crap. Oh, oh. it's okay. <laughs> we are all under a lot of pressure. Yeah, right, we're just trying to help. Well, yeah. Brain, maybe you... Can explain it. Ah, certainly. So... There are these little polyps that can grow inside you. And since we have CF, they can start growing even earlier in life. The longer they're left alone, the greater the risk of them becoming cancerous and spreading to the rest of us. Who knows what'll happen? If it turns into cancer... Whoa, 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 whoa. It's okay. Breathe. Stomach's right. With a colonoscopy, your doctor can find and remove colon polyps before they turn into cancer. Uh-huh. And that's why it's so important for people with CF to get a colonoscopy every five years, beginning at age 40. And at 30, if you've had a transplant. Ah, oh, jeez. I don't want to put you guys in danger. It's all right. We're here for you. And so is the CF Foundation. They even have clinical care guidelines that help you and your care team choose the best approach for your colorectal cancer screening. Okay, so what should I do? Well, for starters, talk with our CF care team. I've got a good feeling about this. Oh, you guys are the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That can be found on the CF, uh, the foundation website. Um, it adds a little humor to a serious discussion. Um, again, it brings, and it gives, brings out the point about the impact of getting cancer, what it does to all the rest of the organs. So what did we do? How did we start? So at the very beginning, obviously we educated the team. We identified all the individuals over the age of 40, 40 and, and above, and started talking with them about the need for colonoscopy. A lot of pushback, you know, people are like, I don't wanna do that, you know, it's, I can't take the time off work, you know, all those, all those excuses. 
Um, then we would set him up for uh, an appointment with our amazing Dr. Stein, our, our GI doc, who would again talk to them about colonoscopy, the prep that's involved, talk about scheduling, and then he would contact his nurse who would take care of all the scheduling. So he took that piece away from us, which was good because it would, would have added a lot more to, to what we already do, and they get the appointment scheduled. As soon as he has the colonoscopy done, he notifies us of the results, whether normal or if there's any kind of a polyp, and then if we need to be rescreening sooner than the five years. So now, continuing to educate the staff, we're identifying individuals 37 years and older. Why 37? So we can start the education sooner, get them used to the idea of getting the colonoscopy. You know, the more they hear about it and understand it, hopefully they will get, they will get there. Um, share handouts, pertinent links like the one I just showed with you. Again, it's an appointment with Dr. Stein. Education, scheduling, and then colonoscopy in the next five years. Did it help? Yes, it has. We've um, been increasing our numbers of colonoscopies slowly but surely. Still working on the rescreen. Um, folks, you know, want to try and push it off a little bit more than the five years. Um, but it's an education piece, again, of talking about the importance of um, repeating that colonoscopy, particularly because we have a chronic illness that impacts the GI tract. Things you don't think about, though, and we've learned this with other with individuals as they go and they start asking these questions. I'm on trikafta. What do I do? I can't, you know, clear liquids don't give me enough fat. A spoonful of peanut butter will give you enough fat to take your trikafta, and it's not going to hurt your prep for your colonoscopy. Or it could be a nut butter, just something that has fat, or a full-fat yogurt. Again, it's not clear, but it's still okay because you're, you're taking it twice a day. You may get three doses before your colonoscopy because of the times of the prep. You start the, the, um, the NPO, not the NPO, excuse me, the clear liquids. So you, you usually people will get their breakfast in first. Um, they start their clear liquids. They continue. They start their wash in the afternoon. They wake up in the middle of the night for their wash. Um, get up in the morning and have another wash <laughs> before, which gets them to the point where they're just about ready for the colonoscopy. So it can be done. So they can't use trichafta as an excuse. Well, I, I have diabetes. What do I do now? We always encourage to reach about, out to your endocrinologist. They're not going to say that, you know, you, you don't have to get away with the, the clear liquids, but they will make recommendations on your insulin dosing and other types of clear liquids that can help you with managing your sugar levels during that period. So it's usually a day and a half that they have to worry about, and our endocrinologists have been great with working with them. So what about the future? What about the, you know, the commercials you're hearing, um, fit test, Cologuard, all those kinds of different things that seem to be less invasive? Um, the future. And actually, I um, was contacted by someone who's looking to the future. And I want to share with you a slide about a study that's upcoming. The NICE study, where they're taking, you know, it's going to be multi-center, compare stool-based testing with colonoscopy for colorectal screening. So it's got to be someone who's over the age of 40, who's due for a colonoscopy without a history of a transplant. Um, and they must be due for their colorectal screening, because they'll do the test the stool test and the colonoscopy both so that they can look at the difference in the results and what's there. And hopefully we may find something that makes uh, life a little easier for folks. They don't have to think about colonoscopy. They have at least got um, another type of testing that can be done. Now, if for any reason the screening gets done, and this is if we were to go this way and it's positive, obviously, then you have to go to colonoscopy. Um, this is being sponsored by St. Louis. There is a contact on here for additional information. Could also find it on the CFF clinical trials under colon cancer. Nice. I want to thank my co, not my, not, I wasn't an author, the authors and my co task force members for all the hard work that was brought into this.
task that we had and for the development of the guidelines. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Joanne. Uh, we do have a couple questions and we have time. Um, a couple people are wondering about the, any tips around preps for these patients. Um, they've noticed that different GI docs have different preps that they may ask their patients to do. Is there any sort of a handout that's available that can be used and shared in terms of prep? Actually, the um, handout that is on the foundation um, website does have recommendations um, for the prep. The main things being that because of the CF population and what we know is it being, you know, this, the prep starting a little bit longer than it would be for you or I um, being done, and that's why they're looking at three to four washes also is just to help completely clean out that gut. But there is some, some good information on that handout with it. There's a question about um, any pushback from insurance companies and payers about um, getting earlier colonoscopies paid for. We have not had any issues, um, but I think with, especially now that we, we have all the recommendations, um, I think we should be able to meet those and prove the, the, the need. And then again, probably now even more so with the recent drop in age to 45 of the general population needing to have the colonoscopy earlier would even be advantageous. Um, uh, I'm assuming that the recommendations for patients with liver transplant versus lung transplant are similar in terms of earlier colonoscopy or are they different? They, we, we determined when we were looking at it that there's not a lot of information when you look at transplant and, and any kind of cancers because um, with, for lung, lung is the primary one that everybody looks at, but we recommend that we follow the same for other transplants. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Next, I'd like to call Dr. Aaron Lowry to the stage. Uh, Dr. Lowry is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She used to be in Chicago, but she left, so, but we still invited her where she is the um, program director for the uh, lung transplant program and the also, also associate director of the cystic fibrosis program uh, there. And she's gonna talk to us about um, guidelines for the care of individuals with advanced uh, lung disease and CF. Uh, she's uh, gonna uh, be very uh, insightful because she take care, takes care of transplant patients as well as CF patients, so welcome. Thank you, uh, Manu and Cindy, for inviting me here today to talk about um, implementation of the Advanced Lung Disease Guidelines. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. However, um, I do have some patient photos that are included in this presentation with the patient's permission. And so jumping right to it, um, a unified definition of advanced CF lung disease um, really wasn't um, put out there until this group was convened to look at the advanced CF um, lung disease guidelines. And so one of the first tasks that the group um, took on was to um, characterize what is advanced lung disease in CF. And so in doing so, they combed through the literature as well as relied on um, expert um, opinion to come up with a nuanced definition of advanced CF um, lung disease. And so the components um, that characterize um, advanced CF lung disease include in clinically stable patients an FEV1 um, less than 40% are predicted, or um, being referred for lung transplant evaluation, um, or one or more of the following, so a previous ICU admission for respiratory failure, hypercapnia, hypoxia, 
um, evidence of pulmonary hypertension, severe functional impairment, or impaired six-minute walk test distance. Additionally, they identified other markers that, that do characterize advanced um, CF lung disease, including um, increased frequency of pulmonary exacerbations, particularly if it's complicated by multidrug-resistant organisms that are becoming more difficult to treat, a rapid rate of decline in FEV1% predicted, any supplemental oxygen use, worsening malnutrition despite adequate supplementation, cystic fibrosis-related diabetes, pneumothorax, and massive hemoptysis. One caveat to this is that this definition was created um, in the era before widespread use of trichafta. And so um, the field is evolving as to how advanced um, CF lung disease looks and what that progression will be into the future with use of um, trichafta. However, I do want to point out um, some recent data from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Patient Registry, which um, if you look at the red bars at the top, um, indicate uh, patients um, with cystic fibrosis who have FEV1s less than 40% of predicted. And you can see that that population really spans the lifespan starting in mid to late adolescence and increasing in prevalence until advanced age. And so this is a population, although we don't know with highly effective modulator therapies um, how that's going to impact their progression over time, as it's been uh, too soon really to have that data, um, we do need to serve those patients who um, don't have highly effective modulator therapy available or have um, substantial underlying um, structural lung disease um, prior to um, the initiation of um, trichafta. And so I did want to briefly highlight a case discussion that I came across recently, um, which um, can highlight some of the issues in this new era of highly effective modulator therapy in patients with advanced CF lung disease, as well as some of the um, uh, guideline statements recommended um, uh, within this case. So this is a 21-year-old with cystic fibrosis who was heterozygous for F508-DEL plus one additional pathogenic mutation. His course was complicated by ABPA, um, and he had been treated with antifungals and prednisone and was on treatment at the time with um, Zolaire. He's pancreatic insufficient, colonized with Pseudomonas and Aspergillus. And his baseline FEV1 um, was about 50% of predicted, and he was on um, therapy with Trichafta. In January of 2022, he was transitioned from pediatric um, CF care to adult CF care. And about four months later, he had his first episode of massive hemoptysis, re requiring ICU care and two days of mechanical ventilation. Fortunately, this resolved with medical management. And in follow-up clinic visit, he had a CAT scan, which shows um, significant underlying structural lung disease, as well as um, a mycetoma, which you can see um, there in the scan on the right. Um, and you can see additional mycetomas in um, uh, um, other cavities um, throughout his lungs. And so elective bronchial artery embolization was scheduled. However, in mid-June, he had a second episode of massive hemoptysis. He um, was emergently intubated and underwent bronchial artery embolization, which was only able to achieve about 90% hemostasis. However, the team felt confident that the bleeding was under control and moved towards extubation. However, as sedation was lightened, his hemoptysis recurred. And on the 18th, he underwent repeat emergent embolization that time. This time it was successful. However, repeat CT scan showed that his right lung was almost entirely filled with blood from the recurrent um, hemoptysis. He was emergently referred for transplant at that time. However, he was deeply sedated and unable to participate in goals of care discussions. Fortunately for him, um, his parents, he and his parents had had discussions about lung transplant. And if it came to that, would he want to consider lung transplant as, as an option, which he did. So he was listed for transplant in July, on July 1st and underwent successful bilateral transplant on the 11th. Um, 
and he is doing well today, almost four months out from transplant. So issues relevant in this case to the guidelines are um, you know, assessment of um, biomarkers of advanced CF lung disease might have hinted at potential um, danger down the road for him. Uh, the proximity of the pediatric transition to adult care with advanced CF lung disease has to be carefully considered as it might lead to additional um, issues in the future. And discussion of advanced care planning so that if a patient gets into an emergent situation, um, both family members, caregivers of the patient really know what direction they want to take their care in in the future. And then, of course, the timing of lung transplant referral being emergent um, was not ideal. And so let's dive into the guidelines that um, the group put together. So the multidisciplinary committee was um, convened in 2017. They utilized um, PICO question, population intervention, comparison group, and outcomes um, to address important aspects of care for individuals with advanced CF lung disease. They developed 23 consensus guideline statements um, and voting met the um, a priori threshold of 80%, and the guidelines were published in 2020. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go over all of the statements here today, um, much to my chagrin, but we will highlight um, uh, some key points, um, focusing on assessment of advanced CF lung disease, encouraging participation in pulmonary rehab, palliation of symptoms, and treatment of mental health, and recommended use of advanced options and referral for a lung transplant and utilization of advanced care planning conferences. So turning to the recommendation for assessing an incorporation of routine interval screenings for markers of advanced CF lung disease into CF care. And so um, as a physician who receives referrals um, to transplant, um, I've often been surprised, especially some of our younger patients in their 20s, 30s, 40s, who are very functional at the time of referral, working full time, might not have an oxygen requirement um, or an oxygen requirement at rest. When you look at them um, through the lens of the eyeball test, they look relatively good. But when you start diving deeper into their actual testing, that's when you start seeing functional impairments, um, gas exchange impairments, and, and potentially even pulmonary hypertension. So it can be tricky to assess them by eyeball testing alone. And if you don't um, look for it, um, you're probably going to miss it. Further, what's really important in this group is to start the testing on the earlier side so that you can follow trends in these patients. Um, and so having the testing and, and having routine intervals where you're looking at gas exchange as well as um, functional abilities is helpful to either reassure the patient, hey, my disease is stable, it's not progressing, you feel good, versus having that testing decline and needing to intensify discussions on an outpatient basis to make sure the patient is planned, has plans for the future in terms of what their goals of care are. And so I think in terms of implementation, it's most important to determine when to start routine testing. And I think in the era of highly effective modulator therapies, this can be a bit tricky. However, the guidelines present a very nice framework as to um, when to consider some of these triggers to start routine testing. So this is a picture of a six-minute walk, six walk test track um, where the six-minute walk test is something that can sometimes easily be obtained and paired with clinic visits and track over time to assess um, how much uh, respiratory impairment they're having as well as um, functional um, capacity. Once within your center, you're able to determine when you're going to start routine testing, um, anticipatory guidance to the patient so it's not out of the blue, hey, I'm, we're going to start all this new testing that we never did before, um, but rather um, in anticipatory guidance over uh, routine CF care, hey, when um, these sorts of things happen that might indicate that you have advanced CF lung disease, we want to look a little bit further and follow these tests over time to see is your lung disease progressing or not. Um, 
the guidelines recommend um, participation in pulmonary rehab for patients with advanced CF lung disease. And we know from multiple studies that both strength and aerobic training improve exercise capacity and quality of life. Some smaller studies even demonstrate um, a potential slowing in the rate of decline in lung function. So this is a study looking at a cohort of patients who completed a formal structured uh, pulmonary rehab program. And you can see the significant improvement over time in their six minute walk test distance. Um, and so um, participation in a formal pulmonary rehab program would be optimal. However, there are multiple barriers to um, participation sometimes in our patients. Um, sometimes that's insurance approval. Uh, many times insurance companies might only approve um, one um, session of, of 12 weeks, and so getting um, uh, approval for that, versus our patients who are more functional and working full-time, participation in a pulmonary rehab program two to three times a week is prohibitive. Um, also, our younger uh, CF patients might feel isolated. Many times the other participants in these programs are of advanced age. Um, and so um, have a plan to think outside of the box. The most important factor is that um, patients with advanced disease are getting daily intentional exercise, whatever that is. And it doesn't have to be fancy. So here is a picture of one of my patients who's conditioning for retransplant. And what you want to ask the patients is, what's available in your house? Some patients have treadmills and bikes, but you know what? You don't need any fancy equipment either. So asking them, do you have a stairwell that you can go up and down? What sort of space is in your house? Of course, if you are fortunate to have a physical therapist as part of your CF team, they're really the content experts and can provide the patients with exercises that they can do at home. You want to use all of the resources available to you. So if they're school age, see if the school can help implement exercise programs. Um, there's peer um, exercise programs that, although they don't focus on respiratory, might be helpful as well. And now um, there's been a lot more development of virtual pulmonary rehab, um, uh, videos on YouTube or even um, formal programs online. Um, that the patient can implement on their own time and at their own pace to at least get things started. Um, palliative care is recommended in these guidelines, and they do. Um, I do reference you to the palliative care guidelines that were published um, in 2021. There's a lot of great information contained in here. And so this is one of the figures from, from those guidelines, looking at um, palliation over the lifespan in patients with chronic disease. And so um, in periods of time where um, the disease is relatively stable, patients are getting care um, getting support from their caregiver as well as from their care teams. And so a lot of um, palliation can take place within the CF care team. Um, however, once they advance to CF, um, advanced CF lung disease and have um, increased symptoms from work of breathing and anxiety over um, advancing lung disease, um, that's a great time to partner with subspecialty palliative care. Um, consider how that looks at your um, center. A partner with the palliative care team um, when the patient might need ad um, additional uh, medications in order to control their symptoms. And also consider the setting in which you can partner with palliative care. Sometimes they're an inpatient service. Sometimes you're fortunate to have both inpatient and outpatient. Um, and collaborating with them to see if there's even times when you can co-manage in clinic together. In terms of mental health, it is common to have increasing anxiety and depression as lung disease advances. And so you want to involve um, psychologists, psychiatrists, um, adolescent medicine, if at all possible. Utilizing virtual video technology has made this a lot easier for our patients. Oftentimes, mental health professionals or palliative care might be more frequent visits. And so to decrease the burden of coming into clinic, utilization of video has been great. And then don't forget the power of peer support groups. Um, uh, patients can um, get relief from a lot of um, mental health anxiety by partnering or uh, connecting with patients who are going through the same thing that they are. Advanced treatment options. Um, uh, prior to uh, widespread use of trikafta in patients with an FEV1 less than 30% of predicted, 
um, the risk of death was about 10% per year. And so you do want to introduce um, at least the concept of potentially needing a lung transplant someday early so the patient can process it um, and talk about it with their family in a kind of non-emergent setting. It also allows the patient to be able to overcome modifiable barriers to transplant so that they're better candidates once they get there. Despite early um, conversations, some patients may unexpectedly progress to respiratory failure and need support from tracheostomy or ECMO. And some um, patients may choose to forego advanced options, which is okay. Um, feedback from um, some of my patients who have gone through um, lung transplant process stated that familiarizing themselves with things like tracheostomy and ECMO prior to needing it in an emergency situation would have been less stressful if they knew what those terms were. There's multiple benefits to um, early tracheostomy as well as ECMO that often overlap. Uh, tracheostomy can be more comfortable. It can allow for interactions with their friends and families. Um, and facilitate mobility and participation in goals of care discussions. Um, here's one of my patients who is um, bridging to transplant where she's able to walk around the ICU several times a day in order to stay fit for transplant. And so when um, thinking about implementation, I refer you to, and encourage you to read the lung transplant referral guidelines that were published in 2019. There's a lot of um, great ideas about um, referral to transplant. Um, and really the bottom line is you wanna normalize this discussion by incorporating it into routine um, care planning discussions so that it's not something um, uh, that is addressed emergently and very quickly. Um, I also encourage you to collaborate with two to three lung transplant programs, get to know them, get to know their practices. Um, each lung transplant program is unique in how it operates, and different lung transplant programs might have um, different experiences or expertise with um, CF patients with advanced lung disease and, and post-transplant care. And finally, turning to advanced care planning. Uh, most advanced care planning conversations, as we know, happen in the hospital during acute illnesses and um, times uh, change in clinical status. And really the feedback from patients has been to try and normalize these conversations in non-urgent times, um, potentially times of clinical stability in the ambulatory setting. And so this is a figure um, contained in the guidelines, um, which is saying once you reach um, once your disease is characterized as advanced, you want to consider these other things in terms of counseling the patients and talking through things with the patients. And so advanced care planning conferences, obviously pre-planning is key. So if you're implementing, um, looking for biomarkers of advanced um, lung disease and um, meeting with the team um, and preparing to meet with the patient, um, what sort of um, things are you gonna present with them? Um, and so centers that have been successful at implementing this have actually separated it from the clinic visit or the hospital setting. And so having a meeting where the patient knows that we're gonna come in and talk about their prognosis and talk about um, what the future holds, what their goals are, what their concerns are, and how the, the CF team can support them as their disease advances. And so in conclusion, um, with implementation of the advanced CF lung disease guidelines, I think the take home points really are to normalize um, assessments for advanced lung disease so that you can follow trends over time, as well as advanced care um, meetings as part of routine CF care. Um, discuss uh, advanced care planning with patients during periods of stability, support nutrition, exercise, mental health, and palliation strategies for symptom management and to slow progressive decline. And then of course, collaborate and build relationships between CF care teams um, and palliative care, mental health, and lung transplant teams to best support patients with CF with advanced lung disease. Um, I wanna thank, of course, Sarah and all the um, people who worked very hard on these guidelines to get them out there. It's fantastic, and um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Erin. There are a couple of questions, first off, about methods to assess advancing lung disease. 
One is, would a sleep study, I, I assume like formal polysomnogram, be preferred and provide better data than overnight pulse oximetry? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, of course, it would provide better data, right? Because there's so much more monitoring that goes into an overnight sleep study. However, um, an overnight sleep study within the lab is, is pretty disruptive to the life. You know, you have to stay overnight there. You get all the glue in your head and <laughs> all of those sorts of things. So it's oftentimes a lot easier to at least start with a screening nocturnal oximetry test. The patient gets a little pulse ox um, that they wear overnight in their own bed, and it at least gives you some idea about how they're doing and are they desaturating overnight or not. Um, so typically, um, that's where I begin um, in screening my patients with advanced lung disease. Uh, just my own follow-up question on that. Do you have a sort of progression of overnight support to start with? low flow oxygen to use more positive pressure? It's, I'm sure it's obviously individualized, but. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's, it's very individualized. Typically, if you start screening early, you're going to catch first um, hypoxemia overnight or um, very abnormal patterns that's going to prompt you to get that in lab overnight oximetry testing or um, abnormalities in blood gases, um, seeing hypercapnia that's going to prompt um, more non-invasive ventilation. Thank you. There's another question about the six-minute walk test, especially in, in a younger population, if it is sensitive enough and would CPET or cardiopulmonary exercise testing be a preferred method? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. Um, at our current center, um, both before and after transplant, we do um, get a lot of six-minute walk tests, and um, uh, you do get a lot more information than you would think. You're right. Our younger patients are fitter, so they, they can go um, farther in terms of their distance, but looking, are they desaturating? What's their heart rate doing? Um, and that oftentimes gives... Uh, me an indication, are they struggling more than you think they would be if that heart rate's going up to 140, 150, either from respiratory impairment or functional um, limitations? Um, obviously, an exercise uh, stress test or um, cardiopulmonary exercise testing is a lot more thorough and gives you a lot more feedback and information. However, it's a lot more burdensome to the patient um, and to the entire um, you know, healthcare system in terms of getting those set up and logistics of it. Um, so I think reserving those for specific situations is best. And there's actually a follow-up question on this is at what FEV1 should we start the enhanced testing such as including the six-minute walk test? Right. Um, and so if you look at these guidelines, they recommend um, an FEV1 less than 40% of predicted. Um, and I do think um, as um, Cindy pointed out earlier, these are guidelines, right? Um, and it depends on the individualized patient. Um, I think the framework presented within the guidelines is, is, is great to help with that nuance. Do they have any more um, on that list of advanced lung disease markers that's going to prompt you to be more aggressive in um, how frequently you're monitoring, right? Um, because certainly, um, the more abnormalities, the more aggressive you want to be with that. And then you, you want to watch the trends over time, right? So if you start on the earlier side and everything's looking great, maybe the next interval might be longer as opposed to someone who has some abnormalities where you're going to have a shorter interval of following that testing. One more quick one about monitoring. Uh, the, the, the role, perhaps, of arterial blood gas or VBG in assessing um, not only hypoxemia, but hypercarbia? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think if you're starting um, monitoring early in, in someone that you expect is um, still early advanced um, lung disease, um, venous blood gas monitoring, especially to monitor trends over time, 
um, is a bit easier and more um, patient kind in terms of not wanting to stick them for that arterial poke every time. And so when you start seeing trends in that venous blood gas um, trending up, um, that is a good time to kind of switch over and um, potentially look at an arterial blood gas to really get a, a, a good sense of what their actual um, gas exchange impairment is. Thank you very much, Erin. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Uh, next, I'd like to ask Dr. Ramsey Hatcham to uh, come to the podium. Uh, Dr. Hatcham is the uh, Tracy Marshall Elbert Trulog Distinguished Professor of Medicine. He's also the Director of the Lung Transplant uh, Program at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And he's gonna talk to us about contested statements of CF lung transplant recipients. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to... Great. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for uh, being here this morning. Uh, I'd like to thank Manu and Cindy for uh, asking me to give this uh, presentation, um, and uh, I'd like to thank the foundation for uh, supporting this uh, lung transplant initiative, which uh, led to these consensus uh, statements uh, for the care of um, individuals with CF who uh, undergo lung transplantation. Um, All right, uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, none of these uh, is uh, relevant to this morning's discussion. Um, I'll start by uh, providing some, some background, but um, I, I want to uh, tell you that um, the slides are, are fairly boring. They're white slides with uh, black uh, font. Uh, it, it's not nearly as, uh, as much fun as uh, my wife, who's a gastroenterologist, is giving a presentation in another session at the same time. So we're both disappointed that we couldn't be in each other's uh, sessions to hear each other talk. Uh, but both of us were going through our slides this, this morning just as a final preparation. And um, as a gastroenterologist, she had all these jokes uh, and all these cartoons in her slides. It's a lot more engaging and a lot more fun. And I think it uh, sort of uh, reaches the inner eight-year-old who uh, is going to laugh at uh, uh, GI jokes. So anyway, these are uh, uh, boring, bland, white and black uh, uh, slides. Uh, but the, the background behind uh, uh, these uh, consensus statements is um, there's a wide variability in the proportion of lung transplant uh, uh, recipients who have CF uh, at different transplant centers. And that's independent of the overall volume of uh, uh, transplants at any center. Uh, as an example, there are uh, centers that do a lot of uh, lung transplants, but they may uh, do very few lung transplants for individuals with CF. Uh, and yet, experience with CF at these uh, lung transplants uh, uh, is really associated with outcomes and, importantly, associated with survival after a uh, uh, lung transplant. Uh, and a transplant at a lung uh, transplant center that has an associated accredited uh, CF care center is associated with a lower risk of death and a lower risk of requiring a retransplant. Uh, and this uh, makes sense. CF is a multi-system uh, disease with uh, important extra pulmonary manifestations that may be exacerbated uh, after lung transplant. And you really need that expertise to manage these uh, uh, extra pulmonary uh, uh, manifestations or the CF-specific pulmonary uh, manifestations that are relevant after transplant. Uh, so I had the, the privilege of working with this uh, terrific group of uh, uh, individuals to put together these uh, consensus statements. Uh, and Sarah, uh, as everyone pointed out earlier uh, uh, this morning, uh, uh, shepherded us uh, through the process. Uh, uh, for many of us, this was uh, the first time uh, going through a consensus statement uh, document like this. Our process was uh, uh, very similar to the uh, other uh, um, groups that uh, already spoke. Uh, we had a multidisciplinary team. There were two individuals uh, who uh, had cystic fibrosis and underwent lung transplantation. Uh, and one uh, who was a caregiver. Uh, the uh, uh, overall group was uh, divided into three work groups. Um, uh, one focused on infectious diseases, one on extra pulmonary manifestations uh, of uh, CF, and one focused on uh, psychology and pharmacology. Uh, we developed these PICO questions, uh, as uh, the other groups uh, uh, did, 
and um, uh, started with a review of the literature. Uh, we identified almost 8,000 uh, uh, references. Uh, obviously, we didn't go through every one of those, but uh, screened them based on uh, initially titles, then what the abstract uh, content was, uh, and then finally the uh, full text uh, articles. And we reviewed uh, nearly 900 uh, full text articles. Now, this was a, a big group, uh, and so it was uh, uh, reasonable to divide the workload. Uh, we ultimately included uh, 357 uh, manuscripts uh, for uh, these consensus uh, statements. Obviously, I'm not going to go through all of the consensus statements. Uh, there's uh, uh, over 20 of them. Uh, so I'm just go going to highlight uh, some of the ones that I think are, are more relevant. Uh, and the document has been published. It's uh, uh, available on the website uh, for anyone who's interested in, in the rest of the statements. Um, so uh, the, the group recommended that, that for CF lung transplant recipients, um, um, they should follow up with the multidisciplinary CF team within six to 12 months of uh, transplant uh, to either resume or continue the extrapulmonary CF care. Uh, and if this is going to happen at the original CF care center, uh, communication between the transplant team and, and the CF team is, is really essential to coordinate that care. Um, the group recognized that there are different models of uh, the shared care, uh, and uh, those uh, really depend on the expertise uh, uh, locally at the transplant center, uh, how comfortable uh, are the transplant providers in managing CF. Uh, and in many centers, um, there's a CF physician who's also a transplant physician, uh, but that's not uh, universal, obviously. And also the expertise in CF care centers uh, in, in transplant management. Um, there are important geographic uh, considerations. Where does the patient live and how far is that from the transplant center? How far is that from the CF center? Uh, and that uh, is really important. At the same time, uh, there's a burden of um, clinic visits and visits to multiple specialists that um, um, sometimes begins to weigh in on uh, individuals who have uh, returned to work or returned to uh, school and have full-time uh, commitments other than uh, seeing pay doctors. Um, I think many are aware there's a white paper that's being developed and it should be out soon that goes through the different models of care and some of these uh, relevant issues uh, that are uh, very practical and important. Next is uh, inf infection prevention and, and control and um, we uh, recommended um, operationalizing uh, IPC policies across all services uh, in the inpatient and outpatient settings. Person-to-person uh, -person, uh, transmission of bacteria and mycobacteria uh, has not been uh, reported after transplant, uh, but there is a risk, and uh, most of us recognize that there is a, a risk, albeit uh, smaller than in the pre-transplant setting. Uh, and so we, we recommended uh, universal and contact precautions. That means uh, gown, gloves, hand hygiene, uh, and masking, uh, and uh, that individuals with CF, regardless of transplant status, uh, maintain a six-foot uh, uh, separation. Okay, on to infections. Um, uh, we recommended consideration of perioperative and early post-transplant uh, use of inhaled antibiotics in, in combination with uh, systemic antibiotics, uh, primarily to reduce the risk of early reinfection. Uh, with uh, the same pre-transplant uh, organisms. Uh, inhaled antibiotics may uh, reduce the uh, risk of early infection, especially uh, when there's uh, potential for toxicity, uh, namely the use of uh, uh, intravenous aminoglycosides uh, in the setting of uh, calcineurin inhibitor therapy where there's a synergistic uh, nephrotoxic effect. Um, on the other hand, we um, uh, found insufficient evidence to recommend uh, uh, the use of inhaled antibiotics uh, in the long term, uh, either to prevent reinfection or to prevent chronic lung allograft dysfunction, or CLAD. Uh, and the risk of reinfection may, may depend on the specific organism uh, that an individual may have uh, pre-transplant and uh, thus post-transplant. Uh, there are no studies uh, that have examined the use of uh, inhaled antibiotics for the prevention of CLAD. Uh, but there is no evidence that inhaled antibiotics prevent the progression of CLAD. Uh, there was at least one or two studies that uh, uh, looked into uh, progression of CLAD, but not development of CLAD. 
Uh, this is a uh, common scenario uh, in the post-transplant setting where um, uh, the patient's doing very well. Uh, there are no cl clinical signs or symptoms of uh, graft in, uh, dysfunction or any signs or, of infection, and they have a bronchoscopy to uh, survey for rejection, uh, but cultures from the bronchoscopy will grow some uh, bacteria, typically uh, Pseudomonas uh, aeruginosa, but other uh, bacteria as well. Uh, and um, uh, we found no evidence, uh, or insufficient evidence, uh, I should say, for the use of antibiotic treatment uh, for these bacteria uh, that are isolated in the airways of asymptomatic uh, CF lung transplant recipients. And so that's really a, a persistent question of what should be done in that setting when there's no sign uh, or symptom of infection or graft dysfunction, and yet uh, the cultures are positive for some bacteria. Uh, there may be a difference between uh, reinfection uh, with the pre-transplant organism uh, that they had uh, and acquisition of a new strain or a new organism. Uh, and there are no studies that have examined the impact of antibiotic treatment uh, in these uh, uh, situations, either to prevent the development of CLAD or to prevent uh, uh, invasive disease uh, or pneumonia. Okay, moving on to extrapulmonary uh, considerations. Um, we recommended that for um, individuals who uh, do not have uh, CF-related uh, diabetes, um, that they be screened with an oral glucose tolerance test uh, three to six months after transplant, uh, then annually. Uh, of note, the, the hemoglobin A1C is not recommended as a uh, screening test, and this was uh, something that I was uh, not uh, aware of. Um, new onset diabetes after transplant typically occurs within the first three to six months. Uh, and treatment with insulin is uh, uh, what's recommended. Um, uh, CF lung transplant recipients uh, who have uh, CFRD uh, are insulin deficient, uh, and there's limited data on the use of non-insulin uh, agents, uh, and there is uh, uh, reports of uh, toxicity. Finally, um, uh, DEXA is uh, recommended uh, at six to 12 months after transplant and longitudinally thereafter to assess bone health. Uh, importantly, uh, for other extrapulmonary considerations, uh, we recommended uh, daily assessment for early signs of constipation in the early uh, post-transplant period and at any time in the future uh, if uh, patients are treated with opiates uh, for some other indication. Um, DIOS uh, is an important uh, complication early after lung transplant uh, with significant morbidity. Uh, and um, uh, ways to prevent the development of DIOS include uh, uh, enzyme replacement therapy, early nutritional, uh, uh, enteral nutrition, uh, bowel regimen, early ambulation, avoiding volume depletion. Uh, and early enteral lavage uh, is recommended for postoperative DOS. Uh, and early diagnosis and, and treatment are uh, really crucial. Uh, and PEG based therapy is the first line therapy uh, with radio opaque contrast uh, uh, treatments, either um, by enema or uh, enterally. Uh, are additional, uh, maybe more uh, intensive and invasive treatments than uh, uh, oral PEG-based uh, therapy. Okay, psychological uh, considerations. Uh, we um, uh, recommended mental health uh, screening uh, for depression, anxiety, and PTSD uh, starting at six months uh, after transplant or within six months uh, of transplant, and then annually thereafter. Uh, there is literature um, uh, that uh, highlights that uh, there's an increased risk of mental health uh, symptoms, particularly in the first six months uh, after transplant, uh, and that these uh, mental health symptoms um, increase the risk of morbidity, uh, increase the risk of rejection, non-adherence, uh, and in uh, some studies uh, increase the risk of uh, death after transplant. Uh, we also recommended uh, mental health screening uh, for caregivers. Uh, specifically for depression, anxiety, and uh, PTSD. Pregnancy was uh, um, uh, an interesting. Uh, I don't want to see. Uh, I don't want to say uh, controversial or, or contentious, but um, uh, there was uh, uh, some uh, uh, quite a bit of interest in in what we were going to say about pregnancy and uh, what the literature uh, said. As you might imagine, there's very limited literature for pregnancy after uh, uh, lung transplant, in particular, or any solid organ transplant. But uh, what we recommended is uh, careful assessment of uh, the individual's risk and avoiding pregnancy in the first two years after transplant. Uh, there's increased maternal and fetal risk associated with uh, uh, pregnancy after transplant. Uh, and pregnancy really should be contraindicated or considered contraindicated if the clinical course is unstable, 
if the patient's doing poorly, they're having declining lung function, um, that's not a, a good situation for, uh, for pregnancy. There's an increased risk of acute rejection, uh, accelerated chronic rejection, and, and death when uh, individuals have become pregnant within two years of, of transplant. On the other hand, uh, successful pregnancies have been reported typically uh, more than two years after transplant. So two years and clinical stability seem to be the most important uh, factors in when would it be appropriate to, uh, to become pregnant. Uh, and lastly, we uh, um, encouraged uh, reporting pregnancy outcomes to the uh, Transplant Pregnancy uh, Registry International, which maintains uh, data on uh, uh, all solid organ transplant uh, recipients who become pregnant. Um, there's uh, insufficient evidence, um, or there was insufficient evidence when we went through uh, the guidelines. Uh, I'm not sure that that has changed um, for uh, recommending for or against the use of modulators after, uh, after transplant. This was a, a very hot topic, and, and I would say remains so. Um, we recognize that uh, there are unique scenarios where modulators are, are beneficial after transplant, uh, sinus disease, malnutrition, GI symptoms. Uh, but there are some potential drug-drug interactions, particularly with uh, CNIs, uh, calcineurin inhibitors, and uh, antifungal uh, uh, drugs. Now, those uh, are not prohibitive, uh, but uh, people need to be aware of them and, and manage the drug-drug uh, interactions. Um, on a uh, less controversial um, uh, topic, um, uh, we recommended uh, careful therapeutic drug monitoring uh, because of altered pharmacokinetics and often abnormal kidney function. Uh, recognizing and emphasizing that serum creatinine is uh, really a poor surrogate marker of uh, kidney function. Um, I don't have very much about implementation, just, just one slide. Um, we all recognize that there are barriers to implementing these uh, uh, recommendations in, in these guidelines in our uh, clinical practice. Uh, um, often um, we're broaching new subjects uh, or, or subjects that may be considered uh, contentious uh, and there's a gap in knowledge within our team members, within uh, other team members at, uh, in the hospital. As, as an example, um, uh, we started implementing the uh, colorectal cancer screening uh, guidelines and referring patients for colonoscopy. And a very senior uh, gastroenterologist reached out to me and said, why are you sending all these people for colonoscopy in their 30s? Mm -hmm. So I had to send them the, the guidelines that were published in the journal Gastroenterology. And <laughs> That was a little bit embarrassing, but you know they, they took it well. But, but that's an example of gap in knowledge. I mean, this is somebody who is a professor of medicine, who's a gastroenterologist, who was unaware of uh, uh, the guidelines and, and the background behind the guidelines of colorectal cancer screening. Um, there's often resistance to changes in, in clinical practice, and uh, we haven't done this before. Why are we doing this? Uh, there's resource limitations, particularly in providing mental health support. Um, uh, and, and that's a, a reality. Uh, there are approaches to improve implementation, uh, Q, QI projects, education, uh, managing up within the organization to uh, tap into resources that uh, are otherwise not available. So uh, uh, to conclude, CF lung transplant recipients are unique. Uh, and require specialized care and, and expertise. Uh, and there are unique pulmonary manifestations uh, related to CF after <laughs> transplant. Uh, and there are uh, unique extrapulmonary uh, manifestations, um, diabetes, nutrition, GI uh, uh, issues. And the best management is long-term follow-up, either through a CF care center uh, or uh, if the expertise is within the transplant center, uh, that would be sufficient as well. And we need partnership uh, with multiple disciplines, uh, GI, uh, endocrine, ENT, uh, to manage uh, uh, all of the manifestations of CF. And those really emphasize the, the need for um, uh, a model of shared care or co-management. Uh, and there are different models that can be very effective depending on patient preferences, um, uh, local resources, and uh, resources at the transplant center. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, there's a question. If patients are still on high doses of steroids at three months post-transplant, is it still recommended to do an OGTT at the time? Or would it be more so recommended if steroids are at a certain dose? Yeah, we, we didn't get into that uh, specific um, uh, question uh, within the, uh, the guidelines, but, but I would say um, 
yes. Um, if you're on high doses of steroids, if diabetes hasn't become apparent, it's probably still a good idea to do the oral glucose tolerance test uh, at that point and uh, subsequently. Thank you. I was uh, wondering, I'm, I'm sure this wasn't addressed in the guideline, but in the pediatric world, you know, we're, we're just drowning in other non-COVID viruses, but is the guidelines were probably in process before COVID, but the role of viral infections, is it more so post-transplant now than it, than it was in the past? Yeah, um, respiratory viruses have been a, a, a real problem uh, uh, even pre-COVID uh, for lung transplant recipients. Um, there's sort of two hits, if you will. There's the acute illness with the respiratory virus, which can make people very sick. But then um, long term, there's a higher risk of uh, chronic rejection or chronic lung allograft dysfunction related to the viral infections. Uh, obviously, COVID changed a lot of things in, in terms of the epidemiology of different viruses um, and I think now we're seeing a lot more of the non-COVID infections, particularly RSV. We seem to be in the uh, midst of an RSV season that's very aggressive, and we're seeing a lot of sick people with RSV. Um, so uh, I have a question, and you alluded to it a little bit at your end. May not may not have been covered in the guidelines, but you know, post transplant, um, there there there's co-managing of care, and you may have a transplant program at your center, but most adult programs probably are not affiliated with a transplant program at their center. So what tips or recommendations can you make for a CF team in terms of how to engage with the transplant center so there's not a, you know, there's not a gap in, in yeah. care? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I mean, it, it's a you know, very practical question that has so, so many ramifications. It, you know, the foundation has had this uh, LLC uh, that initially started out in uh, focusing on referral uh, and building relationships between CF care centers and, and lung transplant centers. And as time has gone on, that morphed into co-management and shared care. Um, now, as a transplant physician, from my perspective, it's the, the onus is on the transplant center to reach out to the CF care centers, but that doesn't have to be the uh, uh, unidirectional. And obviously, CF care centers can reach out to the transplant center. And I'd say that the most important thing is developing a good relationship. Uh, and getting to know the CF care center, uh, CF care center getting to know the uh, transplant center. And it's more than physician to physician, but rather a multidisciplinary team of, of both the CF center and the uh, transplant center that the nurse coordinators know each other well, the dietitians know each other well, the uh, social workers know each other well, and, and the physicians know each other well. And that relationship is, is really critical, I think, in, in terms of having that communication that's necessary uh, of who's going to manage what for this individual patient. We can have a plan uh, in general, but then the individu individual patient who lives a certain distance from the CF uh, center and a certain distance from the transplant center, who's gonna manage what, how are we gonna communicate back and forth? And really that individual relationship between the two teams is, is very critical, I think. It almost sounds like that should be part of the pre-transplant planning uh, yeah, in terms yeah. of how to manage after the transplant is completed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, if you have that relationship, and, and that relationship lasts indefinitely. It's not for just this individual patient, but it's going to last indefinitely. It's going to get better uh, over time. I was wondering, too, about the role of telemedicine in co-management of post-transplant. Have you had any experience with that in the last couple of years? Yeah, not, not, not me personally. We uh, um, were limited in terms of the use of telemedicine uh, uh, within our uh, transplant center, but uh, that certainly can break down some of the geographic barriers that you can uh, reach the patient without them leaving their house or, or, uh, or whatever. Now, there are uh, some logistical barriers as, as time has gone on be beyond the emergency use of uh, telemedicine where if you have a patient who lives in a different state, You've got to have a license in that state to provide a uh, televisit. Um, and that can become problematic if you're in a part of the country where you're serving a multi-state region. Um, but but it, it is uh, something that uh, can be helpful. We do have time for a couple of questions. If there's somebody in the audience um, has anything they'd like to ask Dr. Hatcham. Um, 
have you been using home spirometry for uh, monitoring your patients? Because this is obviously an important topic in the CF community, pre-transplant now. So is there anything you could share with us that might inform how to, how to use that effectively? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, we've been using uh, um, home spirometry for a very long time. Uh, and the devices have become very sophisticated, but yet you have uh, devices that are just as good that are very inexpensive. Um, I'm very disappointed that this idea of home monitoring with spirometry has not been more effective in our experience uh, in the post-transplant setting. And what often happens is patients get the uh, spirometer, they're using it diligently early after transplant, but when they really need it, when they're being seen less frequently in, in clinic visits, unfortunately many patients stop using it. Uh, and those that continue to use it I mean, kudos to them, they're doing a great job, but those are the people who are you know, very diligent in their care and are not gonna miss an appointment, and they're gonna call with um, symptoms where others may not, and unfortunately, those are the ones that are less diligent with uh, using uh, the spirometer at home. There's another question about vaccination after transplant. Are centers reducing immunosuppression prior to vaccination, especially the COVID vaccine? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, th there were uh, quite a bit of data uh, showing that um, um, uh, solid organ transplant recipients did not mount a good response to uh, the COVID vaccinations. Uh, and in kidney transplantation, uh, uh, those who were not on a cell cycle inhibitor, azathioprine or, or mycophenolate, mofetil, had a better response to the vaccine than um, uh, those who were taking three immunosuppressants. Um, I'd say that that's somewhat controversial. Um, uh, to stop the uh, cell cycle inhibitor for a period of time uh, to try to uh, get a better response to the vaccine, um, I think some centers have done that uh, sparingly. Uh, there's always the risk of rejection, which in lung transplantation is always higher than the risk of rejection in other solid organ transplants. So I, uh, at our center, we did not do that. Uh, we did not uh, uh, hold uh, a cell cycle inhibitor um, with the hope of uh, getting a better immune response to the vaccine. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. So I think we've come uh, towards the end of our uh, two hours. just want to thank our uh, excellent speakers uh, updating us on these guidelines and some strategies on uh, implementation. And I want to thank you guys for coming this morning and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you.